prior to two billion years ago, there were only two domains of living things, the eubacteria and the archaea. But somewhere in the time period of two billion years ago and one and a half billion years ago, a new domain of living things evolved the eukaryotes from um, eubacteria living inside an archaeon. But there is clearly a difference between an archaeon with an endosymbiont and what I'll refer to in this uh, video as Lika, the last eukaryote common ancestor, the cell which could have given rise to all of the modern eukaryotic lineages, which would include plants, animals, fungi, and the most primitive protists such as Giardia. What changes would have evolved in the time period between the endosymbiosis and Lika? Clearly, there are a long list of features which eukaryotes share, which are not found in either archaea or eubacteria. Um, the problem is we do not have uh, a good representative of the original host cell which took on the symbiont. So for example, we cannot uh, be certain whether the nucleus predates the symbiosis event or whether the nucleus came afterwards. Um, the uh, original host must have had some modifications of the cytoskeleton, but a cytoskeleton truly capable of amoeboid uh, movement and phagocytosis uh, may have evolved in stages afterwards. Other things like uh, the cell division, which we refer to as mitosis, regulation of this cell cycle, cilia and flagella, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and Golgi, um, without representatives of uh, this original uh, eukaryotic uh, cell or any line lineages prior to Lika, uh, it is difficult uh, to try to pinpoint uh, any of these evolutionary events. It is perhaps easier to study the changes which would have to occur from the ancestor of the mitochondrion to become the mitochondrion uh, with which we are familiar. It started off as an independent free-living eubacterium, but it would become then an endosymbiont dependent on its host. Uh, for this, there would have to be the development of protein transporters and carriers to import proteins from the cytoplasm to the symbiont. There would need to be the modifications of the inner membrane of this developing mitochondrion uh, for uh, things like uh, the cellular respiration, which would produce ATP. The loss of symbiont genes would entail the reduction of most of the original host chromosome. Some of these genes would be transferred to the nucleus in endosymbiont gene transfer so that the nucleus would then actually produce many of the proteins for the mitochondrion, which were originally encoded by the mitochondrion. There would be the coordination of the biochemistry and the cell division signals between the host and the symbiont. And then the specialization of many of the membranes uh, of uh, the host uh, and even the cytoskeleton so that uh, these two would then interact with each other. Presumably, any features which are shared by eukaryotes, ranging from plants, fungi, and animals such as humans, and uh, primitive eukaryotes like Giardia, uh, but are not present in any bacteria, these must have evolved somewhere between uh, early eukaryogenesis and Lika. A problem, however, is let's consider Giardia. It lives in very low oxygen environments like the intestine. Is that because it has retained a primitive eukaryotic condition or that it has secondarily adapted to life in intestines? If Giardia is not capable of sexual reproduction, is this because Lika was not capable of sexual reproduction or that Giardia secondarily lost this ability? And then also, Giardia possesses primordial Golgi, but not Golgi, and mitosomes, but not mitochondria, as I will pursue in the next video. Was this a feature of Lika, 
or a secondary loss um, from the condition of Lika to uh, Giardia as it's specialized for its parasitic lifestyle.